The internet is revolutionizing America. It's changing how we buy things. It's changing how we communicate with each other. It's changing how we consume information. And of course, it's changing how we engage in politics. We didn't always think so. The initial thought about the internet was, it's not going to be that big a deal. I already have campaign material. I mail it to people. I call them on the phone. I put up those little signs all over the city that never seem to go away. <laughs> if I put it up online, all I'm really going to do is give another place for someone to delete, or at least avoid going. But the truth is, is the internet made a very big difference on campaigns. It became a place where you could organize how you were going to attack the voters, literally. It became a place where you could communicate directly with people. It became a place, most importantly for politicians, where you could raise lots of money. It became vital to campaigns. In fact, so vital that research in political science has suggested that an online presence in a campaign is one of the key components to winning in modern elections. But the internet isn't just about campaigns. The internet is a vast landscape of information. It's a place where you can find out information on just about anything that you want to know. You can find out about laws and policies. You can find out about what your congressman is doing. You can find out who your congressman is. You can even find out what's going on in Washington if you're not distracted by whether or not Justin Bieber was elected <laughs> or arrested. But the interesting question is, what does that mean? Can I get that information? Sure, but do I want to get that information? Because it's there, do I seek it out? The, uh, the evidence suggests to us that that's not really what's happening. The internet's made a big difference in some places. If you go, for example, to the Middle East, you can see the internet has an important role in the Arab Spring or the Green Revolution in Iran. But when you come back to the United States and you look at it, you start to say, well, do people know more than they did before we had all this information available to us? It's so easy to get. I can search, I can use Google to find anything, and yet survey after survey suggests that we actually know less than we knew before. How is that possible? It's so easy. I remember as a graduate student, if I wanted to see what a foreign newspaper looked like, I had to go to the library. That's that building with the books. <laughs> and then up to the periodical section, where they would have newspapers on rollers. I know some of you remember, right? <laughs> and you'd have to find the right newspaper, and if you were lucky, somebody didn't tear out the page you were looking for. Today, I can find any newspaper I want. I can search it right on the internet, and Google or my web browser will translate it immediately. So why do we know less? Shouldn't we know more? Part of the answer is, it's what we want to know, right? When you go online, you're much more likely to go see whether or not your latest celebrity has broken up with their boyfriend, then you're going to go find out what happened with tax law, right? This is sort of who we are. But we discovered a bigger problem, not just what we desire to know when it comes to entertainment news, but the bigger problem really has to do with us. When we grow up and as we get older, we start to get ideas of what the world looks like. We develop our ideologies, whether conservative or liberal or somewhere in between. And we get a grasp of what we think the world looks like. And when we're confronted with information, that is not consistent with what we think of the world, we get uncomfortable. We call it cognitive dissonance, which is that feeling you get in the pit of your stomach when somebody tells you something that you don't want to believe. We all know it. It happens to all of us. Here's a classic example, right? Let's say you're a nice liberal person, and your friend picks you up, you step into their car, you sit down, they turn on the radio, and you hear Rush Limbaugh. And you think to yourself, no! Turn it off. Change it. Isn't there something about Justin Bieber we can listen to? I don't want to hear it. I have a, a, an older friend of mine who's very conservative, and just for fun sometimes I play a little game with him when he comes over. I'll record a few minutes of the Rachel Maddow show. <laughs> I'll play it on my DVR as he's coming over, and it's a good scientific experiment. I test to see how long it takes him to get from the front door to the off button on the TV. One time he did it in 4.7 seconds, which I have to say was pretty remarkable because he is not a young man. 
But that pit in our stomach, that feeling that we don't want to hear that kind of stuff is, is part of human nature. It didn't used to matter. If you think back to the beginning of the media revolution, there weren't a lot of choices, right? If you wanted to watch the news, it was Walter Cronkite or your morning paper, or if you're old enough, your evening paper. But there wasn't a whole lot in between. We had a common base of knowledge. Whether I was liberal or conservative, Republican or Democrat, I had the same basic information that we all had. But the internet is different. I don't have to listen to Walter Cronkite. I don't have to read my local newspaper. And judging by what it looks like in the morning in my neighborhood, not many of you are. I can go right to the internet and I can go find the information that is consistent with what I already believe. Think about how you behave when you're on the internet. You go to the same three or four websites. You tend to read the same people with the same kinds of opinions. We took a vast landscape of information, a world of information, an unprecedented amount of information, and instead of sharing and learning through that information, we started to pave ourselves very narrow pathways through it to exactly what we wanted to hear. We've created our own bubbles, our own echo chambers, where everything sounds exactly like it should. I see this in my classrooms, by the way, all the time. If we have a discussion about a political issue, I will literally watch one part of the class hurl talking points at the other part of the class and hurl them back. And I will watch the perplexed expressions on their faces. Like, how can they possibly believe that? Everyone agrees with me. Everything I read agrees with me. Everyone I talk to agrees with me. And yet, it's not really the world. It's their world that they're living in, the limited world that we create for ourselves. In fact, the social media helps us do that. Algorithms on websites like Facebook actually organize the information based on what we like. They're anticipating who you like and who you don't and giving you exactly what you want to hear by design. And we're quite happy with that. And we help along too, right? Everyone knows that annoying person that they regretted they friended on Facebook who keeps publishing that political stuff. Eventually you sneakingly defriend them and hope that they don't notice. Because right? we don't want to see that in our feed anyway. Why does this matter? Why do we care that we sort of isolated ourselves and created these bubbles for ourselves? What, what's the big picture question here? Well, it has to do a little bit with how we communicate with each other and what it means when we actually engage in face-to-face -face friendships rather than online friendships. And the problem is, without some ability to understand the other side, there's no context. There's no way to communicate. If I'm a conservative, I don't know what conservatism means unless I understand what liberalism means. I don't understand light if I don't know what darkness is. There's no context to our information, and we isolate ourselves, and we can't even communicate with each other in a way that is effective, in a way that allows us to compromise or understand. If someone doesn't agree with us, it's because they're ignorant, or because we don't like them, or there's something wrong with them in the head. This is a bad approach to politics because our government is based on the very idea of design compromise. And when we isolate ourselves and we polarize ourselves, we can't communicate, we can't compromise, and we have a real trouble governing. Now, a lot of people want to blame this on the internet. They say the internet is causing all these bad things. But that's not the truth. The truth is it's us. It's inside of us. It's our disposition, our desire not to hear the things that we don't like. There's no universal solution here. I can't tell you to unplug the internet. Don't think anyone can do that, not even Al Gore. <laughs> I can't tell you not to be human, because we are, right? And, and we're going to have our thoughts and views about them. But you have to force yourself to do something like what you're doing here today, which is confronting and listening to things that sometimes you may not agree with, because that creates a wider worldview. You don't have to agree with everything you see, but you have to be exposed to it so you can at least understand the perspective. So the next time that you go online and you think, I'm going to avoid listening to that or reading that, read it anyway. If you have to get over your cognitive dissonance, just say, this is so I can argue better against it. Whatever works for you. But remember, the fault is not the technology. What we have to overcome is how we deal with the information.